Hello, and welcome to Chess Openings Explained. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will be your host here today. Uh, and the topic for today, I wanted to focus on the uh, open Catalan, rather, as opposed to the closed Catalan. Uh, the Catalan, I feel like, is a one of those openings that a lot of players struggle with uh, from, the black, uh, from the black side. White seems to get a small nagging advantage without really risking anything. It's one of those openings where it's difficult to uh, find a way to really pose serious problems to white. But I do believe that the open Catalan is the best choice for black. The closed Catalan, uh, of course, has its uh, supporters as well. But I do think the open is easier to play. And so tonight, I wanted to take you through sort of the three main variations that you're going to face against the Catalan and make some recommendations in each one. Why I think some lines are better than some others. And hopefully, by the end of it, you'll have a pretty well-rounded view of what the Catalan is, how to play against it, and you'll feel uh, more than comfortable the next time you face it. So to start off with, I have a game between Levon Aronian and uh, women's uh, number one player, Howie Fon. A former women's world champion, of course. And this is a game where Hao Yifan introduced a relatively new idea. I'm not sure if it was, you know, 100% a novelty, the move that she played, but this is the game that sort of brought this move back into the limelight. Uh, the game that uh, has become very relevant as the move that was played in this game is now played uh, quite often against the Catalan. So to start with, uh, in this game, they arrived at the Catalan via this move order, d4, c4, uh, knight f3, and d5, and now g3. So of course, with knight c3, we would transpose into some queen's gambit decline positions. With g3, white is uh, go going ahead and committing to playing the Catalan. Uh, now d takes c4 is playable immediately, but I like delaying it. So we have bishop b7, bishop g2, castles, and castles. And this is sort of the starting position for us here. Um, now in this position, if you play a move like c6, you are playing the closed Catalan. You are keeping the center closed, uh, specifically keeping this diagonal closed. And uh, this is a perfectly fine way of playing. The downside is that I do think it makes white's play a little bit more free. White's going to be you know, developing this piece out this way, developing the queen out to c2. And at the end of the day, you're going to have to be facing some e4 threats and some, some threats on the queen side as well. Uh, so the line I'm recommending is the open Catalan, which of course happens after d takes c4. Uh, with d takes c4, uh, you now open this diagonal and open up the center, and the play becomes a lot more direct. So this is more or less our starting tabia for tonight's lecture. Uh, those first moves that White played uh, are pretty consistent to arrive at the Catalan, being kettling the bishop, knight f3, d4, and c4, and, and castling. And so here is where we really make our decision, d takes c4. Now from here, there are three main options that I'm going to cover here today. I will briefly mention just at the start of the hour here uh, that White does have some other various options, and I'll, I'll point those out. Uh, in this game, we're going to look at the main move, which is queen c2. There's also the choice of playing the move knight e5 for white that we're going to look at next. There's also the choice of playing queen a4 for white, but we'll come to find out that queen a4 is quite often just seen as a slightly worse version of queen c2, and that's why queen c2 is more popular. And then just a brief mention to the other options white has. White can also play knight a3, trying to regain the pawn, knight c3, or knight bd2. Uh, all in this main position. I think even a4 has been played, but these are really uh, sidelines that, uh, that I'm talking about here. For example, if knight c3, uh, the move knight c6 is actually quite playable for black, highlighting the fact that this pawn is just a little bit awkward here. If knight a3, we can actually capture this knight uh, on the board, and we get a strange version of uh, the lines that we're going to see with knight e5. And with something like knight bd2, I think even the move b5 is, is quite strong. So those are, are very much sidelines. We're not going to focus on those. We're going to focus, in this game in particular, on the main main line with queen c2. Now players with the black pieces have tried all sorts of things here. The move a6 is kind of the front runner here uh, as far as uh, main variations. And now this is the reason why queen c2 is seen as slightly better than queen a4. They both have the idea of playing queen takes c4, but with the queen on c2 after a6, uh, white has the very serious option of playing the move a4. 
uh, and this is designed to sort of prevent this move b5 for a little bit. So while you can play like this, and uh, there's a, a lot of theory to go around there, in this game, Hao Yifan introduced the idea of playing b6 in this position. Now, b5 has also been uh, played in the past, and it is a, a very serious move. It's responded to by a4 most, most of the time, and then b4, and you get a very interesting position. But the move b6 was Hao Yifan's idea, not going two steps. Now, uh, right off the bat, uh, white does have a few options here. At first glance, it looks as though you've done nothing to prevent queen takes c4. And while this is true, uh, thanks to our move order here, we get to develop our bishop to a very comfortable diagonal on b7, and queen takes c4 is, is really not a very testing variation to look out for. The game might continue with knight c3, knight bd7, uh, rook over to d1, and c5. And black, uh, once uh, once black has achieved c5, this is sort of the freeing move that black was looking for. And after c5 in this variation, it, it does become very easy to play. If d takes c5, uh, highlighting this pin, we can just simply recapture with the bishop. And then play would continue from here. For example, b4, bishop b7, uh, bishop b2. Well, sorry, we actually we can even insert some funny business here uh, by taking on f2. But let's say bishop b7, bishop b2. And now a move like rook c8 is OK for black. Uh, so queen takes c4 isn't the main variation by any stretch of the imagination. It's sort of playing into black's hand. Black played b6, and if uh, black is allowed to play bishop, e7, bishop b7 sort of unhindered, then black is really not going to have any problems. There's one uh, obvious tactical downside to playing this move b6, and that's what was tried in this game by Levon and Ronian. Uh, and this is sort of, uh, if you're going to refute this line by black, this is the way you're going to do it. So does anybody in the YouTube chat see that, uh, that move here for, um, uh, for white? The move to sort of try and refute black's opening play. It's pronounced as hu yifan, not hao yifan. Thank you for the pronunciation help. This is always a struggle for me. Uh, does anybody see the most testing variation? I'm not getting it. Ah, yeah, we have two answers, both correct. It's the move 95. This is sort of the, the main testing variation that uh, is probably the reason that this line was not so popular for quite a while. And so with 95, obviously there is a problem for black. Uh, the problem is this rook on a8. And at first glance, it looks as though that um, white is, is sort of just winning here. Uh, the only really playable moves look like knight d5 or c6. This is the only way to really save the rook. And these are not very happy moves. For example, if you play knight d5, there's uh, all sorts of options here for, uh, for white. You could even just capture this. And this knight is not at all comfortable on this d5 square. And obviously, if you play the move c6, you're just sort of asking for trouble. This pawn is immediately hanging if uh, white wants to capture it. And in fact, probably he should. And this is... Uh, just not ideal for, uh, for black, quite obviously, going down a pawn. But there is a third move in the position, and that's the move that uh, Hu Yifan uh, plays in this position, and that's queen takes d4. And this is just simply an exchange sacrifice. Uh, but thankfully, it is a good exchange sacrifice for black, and uh, black is going to find sort of level play uh, after this sacrifice, as we see in this game. It's not as though black is winning with this exchange sacrifice, but it is a perfectly playable position, and it's a very interesting position, which is why I, I like it uh, for playing against the Catalan, because you know, Catalan players sort of have a reputation for getting this, this sort of boring uh, long-term advantage, and with this, I do think that black effectively neutralizes it and creates sort of an interesting imbalance with the exchange sacrifice. So uh, once this has been played, white is sort of obligated to capture this rook, and then queen takes e5, regains the minor piece. Uh, now there are a few things that can be played here, but uh, it really is in white's best interest to evacuate this bishop sort of as quickly as possible. If white gets a little bit carried away with a tempting looking move like bishop f4, we're going to get met with queen h5, and then all of a sudden, bishop f3, knight g4, and white is sort of being forced to create uh, more weaknesses on the king's side with moves like this. Then immediately e5 is quite strong. And if you're not careful, you might just sort of get run over by a move like bishop takes h4. So very, very quickly, things can go wrong for white if uh, white isn't really aware 
of the, the proper way to play against this. And just to show you the line, this would be sort of disastrous for uh, white. Uh, bishop e7, for example, f3 is forced, queen g3 check, e4, and things sort of uh, fall apart quite, quite quickly for white in this specific line. Of course, this is not what Levon Aronian did, but it goes to show you how quickly things can actually go wrong for white if uh, he or she is not prepared. So in this game, Levon Aronian plays the best move, which is bishop f3. Uh, and bishop f3 is better than bishop g2 for a couple reasons. One of those reasons is the lines that we just took a look at, things like queen h5 and knight g4, are a lot more difficult to uh, obtain with this bishop on f3. The bishop on f3 also does a nice job of supporting this pawn back on e2 if anything bad were to happen to it. Uh, now that this bishop is placed here, bishop f4 does become a pretty serious threat, kicking our queen, and that's why the next move is knight d5, just keeping an eye on this square. Now the time has finally come for white to regain the pawn, so queen takes c4 is pretty natural. And after this, we are going to develop not to b7 anymore, but to a6 with tempo on the queen. And black now has some nice pressure on, uh, on e2. Levon Aronian, uh, I believe, picked the best square for his queen in this game. Uh, various moves can be played, queen e4 even. But I do think a4 is the best square for this queen. It puts some pressure on this bishop, making it awkward for this knight to develop, and even pressures a7, uh, sort of indirectly. And from here, it does seem as though uh, the black concretely only has one pawn for the exchange. And, you know, historically, uh, that's been seen as an advantage for the side with the exchange. Of course, we have 3 plus 1 equaling 4, and the rook worth 5. 4 is less than 5. So you'd rather have the exchange in most of these cases. However, black does actually have some very concrete positional gains in this position. In particular, we'll see in this game, uh, Hu Yifan starts with the move c5. And this is a, a great way to play for black. Uh, the point of c5 is basically just to say, I am going to sort of take over the center in, in the queen side with this extra pawn. And if you're not careful, moves like knight c6, moves like knight d4, and you could very, very easily be run over altogether with this lack of development that you have on the queen side. For example, just imagine a knight landing on d4 on, on this turn. Obviously, it, it really can't happen. But a knight from this square would very much pressure f3, pressure e2, and white is going to find uh, himself in, in quite, a, quite a great deal of trouble. Uh, in the game, uh, rook e1 was actually Levon Aronian's choice. And this is not my favorite move of all time. It does just provide more support for the e2 pawn. You can even think about expanding this pawn out to the e4 square on some occasions just to get rid of this annoying knight. But for the moment, it's sort of just a solid defensive move that Levon was trying. Uh, there are other moves here for white. Uh, really, from this position, it, it is just going to be uh, a chess game. So if you're not comfortable playing down the exchange like this, uh, then this isn't going to be one of those cases where opening theory sort of guides you into a totally uh, comfortable position after the exchange sacrifice. You, you do uh, fully sacrifice this exchange and, and you're not really planning on getting it back anytime soon. So that's sort of something you have to be ready for if you want to play this opening line, but I do think it is uh, quite worth it here. In light of the move that Hao Yifan played against Rook E1, which is going to be the move B5, taking more space, uh, players with the white pieces have sort of tried this move knight a3 on occasion, just highlighting that he wants to control uh, the, these squares in particular. And against this, uh, various moves have been played by black as well. Queen c7 is one of them, and after a move like rook d1, uh, black sort of just takes over the center with the bishops. And this is definitely one way of playing. But let's focus on our main game, which goes rook e1 and then b5 by black. And uh, now, Hu Yifan is just sort of uh, taking over on the queen side. Uh, feeling the pressure a little bit, Levon actually offers up a queen trade, not wanting to let this active centralized queen sort of stand. And from here, knight c6 was Hu Yifan's uh, try. And uh, this move may not be uh, actually the most accurate. Uh, now after knight c3, white sort of has natural development. Uh, and honestly, keeping the queens is, is a, a pretty great way of playing for black. And if you are going to trade the queens, well, do it with tempo. And that way, you have time to play this move b4. And you really do 
uh, sort of hamper white's development in, in this manner. So one of those situations where developing, uh, always you know, not the worst idea, but perhaps black could have gone for a little bit more with a move like b4 after taking on e4, and now these pieces re remain awkward. Sort of. You don't really want to play a move like knight d2, blocking in your bishop, and you really can't find a good square for your bishop, because if you play bishop d2, well, that's where your knight was supposed to go, sort of. So could have been interesting. Instead, though, knight c6, and now white does get to develop with knight to c3. Uh, how you fun continues naturally with rook to d8, and is sort of not in much danger. Now we see rook d1 by Levant, sort of admitting that rook e1 was perhaps not the most accurate, uh, repositioning this rook now to be on a slightly better uh, open file. Uh, Hou Yifan now does sort of flinch first and captures on e4. Uh, we see bishop takes e4 by white, and now this knight does land on d4. And I think simply this is just going to be enough compensation for black with these powerful central knights uh, to more than justify uh, sort of giving up this exchange here. In the game, Levon played bishop takes on d5, uh, and rather than take on d5 immediately, Hou Yifan actually inserts a pretty clever move, b4. And the point is now uh, we'd rather take the knight instead of the bishop in this specific case because this knight is defending the e2 square. And so if this knight falls, then we get to munch, munch, munch on all the juicy pawns. And that's exactly what happens in the game. Bishop b3 is sort of the only move. If you come back in this direction, then this is sort of just devastating. Uh, don't want this at all. So bishop b3. And now after b takes c3, we have b takes c3. Knight takes e2 check. King g2. This is why we sort of needed uh, the g2 square for a king. And now uh, a move like knight c3 would be fine. How you fun, or who you fun, inserts bishop b7 check first. Now after f3, see a trade of the rooks. And who you fun captures on c3. And we arrive at this end game, which is uh, arguably slightly better for white, but with these uh, two strong bishops for black. Really, black should have no problem holding this, and Hu Yifan had no problem holding this in the game. And then move bishop d2 was Levon's choice, and now after knight takes d1, rook takes d1, uh, black is left with a bishop pair, and bishop d5 played in the game, rook b1, g5, dealing with any back rank mate threats, king f2, bishop takes a2, rook a1, bishop d5, uh, bishop c3, f6, rook takes a7, king f7, uh, king e3, e5, h4, rather h4, captures, captures, h5, f4, takes, takes, king e6, check, bishop d6, check, and then uh, to avoid any sort of danger, uh, Levon actually captures on d6, and they agreed to a, a draw here. Uh, obviously, I sort of sped through that endgame, uh, but that's mainly because the endgame is, is not really the point here. The point was uh, you can get sort of an active game with black using this variation, and that is the line I'm going to recommend to you for uh, the black pieces against the main main variation of the Catalan. Let's go back and review re really quick, because I do think there is uh, one sort of moment that I skipped over that we're going to take a look at next. So we have all the Catalan moves, castles, castles, we take on c4. Queen c2 is the main variation, and b6 is the idea by Hu Yifan that she uses here. Now, uh, the main variation that we took a look at is knight e5. We also briefly mentioned the move queen takes c4, but we're going to see that the move bishop g5 is perhaps the trickiest approach by white, and so we'll take a look at that next. But knight e5 in this game, black has to take on d4, white more or less has to take on a8. We have queen takes e5. F3 is the best square for the bishop, not allowing queen h5 and knight g4. Knight d5 now by black, keeps an eye on the f4 square. We have queen takes c4, bishop a6, queen a4, and now c5 by black. And this is sort of just the, the start of the middle game position. From here there are many options for both sides, but largely the idea is for black, get your rook to the center, expand on the queen side, try to get this knight to d4, and then life is, is reasonably comfortable for black. Uh, okay, any questions on our main variation before we move on to the next example? Uh, why does black never develop his bishop with tempo? Okay, Manny answering his own questions. What if bishop takes e6? I'm not sure where you're mentioning uh, that Manny, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, not sure. 
Well, in that case, I think we are ready to move on here. So let's take a look at another game. This one uh, between uh, Studer and Etienne Becro. Uh, I think these were both grandmasters playing in this game. Uh, in this case, Studer starts with the move d4. We have knight f6, c4, e6, knight f3, d5, g3, bishop e7, bishop g2, castles, castles, arriving at our main position here. d takes c4, queen c2, b6, and then this is the game that uh, white tried bishop g5. This uh, I've called it the trickiest of white's options, and it's definitely one that needs to be on your radar. It's actually surpassed knight e5 as the most popular move in this position for white, sort of at a, a top level. And the reason for that is that uh, this exchange sacrifice has sort of just been seen to be fine for black. So players with the white pieces have turned to bishop g5 instead to try to prove an advantage. But we'll see, as Etienne Bacro did with the black pieces here, it really is sort of a paper tiger, as they say you know, uh, kind of an empty threat with bishop g5. So there is just one thing you need to avoid after bishop g5, and the thing you need to avoid is playing this move, bishop b7. This is just losing now for black right out of the gate. So who sees the tactic that uh, white cleverly set up with the move bishop g5? Who sees white to move and win in this position? White to move and win here. What do you guys got for me? Yes, uh, Piyush does have it. It is bishop takes f6. Uh, black is obliged to recapture. And then this move knight g5 is rather annoying. Uh, checkmate is threatened, as is b7. Uh, capturing the full piece does not preserve the material because bishop takes b7, and this rook on a8 is indefensible. Now we don't even have our clever queen takes d4 in exchange for it. Uh, knight d7 takes, takes, and this is not a good exchange sacrifice for black any longer. Uh, so this is something you absolutely must avoid. Uh, that's why the main move here is just the move knight to d5. Offering up this trade of bishops and blocking off this diagonal for the moment. Uh, bishop takes e7, queen takes e7, and now white most often uh, goes ahead and recaptures here on the c4 square. Uh, and now we sort of fall back to what kind of happens after queen takes c4 immediately. This is going to be pretty similar to it, with black just sort of developing naturally and eventually going for a c5 move uh, in an effort to just totally equalize. Uh, in this game, uh, Bacro goes for bishop a6, queen c2, and now knight d7. Just supporting the c5 break, we have knight c3 pressuring d5, and simply c5 by black. And black is doing totally, totally fine here. So once again, this is sort of the fallback plan if white uh, does something rather slow with his pieces, doesn't create a ton of threats, or uh, especially when he, he doesn't go for this line where he wins the exchange in exchange for the d4 pawn and the e5 knight. Uh, black just develops calmly, gets his pieces out, sometimes with tempo if possible, on the queen on c4, and then plays the move c5. And after c5, uh, there, if there aren't immediate complications, then black is doing totally, totally fine. And you can just bring your rooks to the open file, and there's absolutely no reason why black should be worse. In this game, uh, white tried to go for knight takes d5, we have e takes d5, and then rook f to e1, supporting the center. Simply bishop back to b7 now. It sort of served its purpose on a6, forcing this queen off of the active c4 square. And so bishop back to b7 now is calmly defending the center pawns against white's threats. Uh, so, sorry, not rook fd1, rook fe1 rather. Rook fd1, of course, would uh, hang this pawn and be totally fine for black. Rook e1, and now bishop e7, uh, forcing both of these awkward moves by white. Uh, queen a4 was played in the game. Rook f e8 just takes control of this half open file. And now rook a to c1 was played, and simply a6 by black. And a6 sort of indirectly uh, creates the threat of playing b5 and c4, following it up with 
things like b4 and just expanding on the queen's side. Rather than allow that, white did take this moment to capture on c5, and now rather than take back with the knight, accepting an isolated queen pawn, uh, black captures back with the pawn, and we have now a hanging pawn structure by black, and this uh, proved to actually be pretty good for black as Etienne does go on to win this game using this structure. Once again though, just a comfortable middle game position, neither side really having any kind of advantage here, but there's a lot of play in the position. That's, that's the point, is black is getting imbalances, getting something to play for, and that's why I do like these, these variations. In the game, queen a5 was played, rook a c8 is natural to defend this pawn, knight back to d2, tries to put some pressure, uh, simply knight f8 by black, prepares to reroute this knight. We have e4 by white, breaking down the light squares, and d4 uh, opens this diagonal and maintains the structure. Knight b3 now is pressuring this pawn. Uh, we have knight e6 to defend the structure, rook c4, rook d8, rook d1, and now f5 was a pretty nice idea by Bacro to open the long diagonal and actually start fighting for a win. Uh, white doesn't dare capture this pawn on account of the move knight g5 when you are sort of getting checkmated on the, uh, the king's side here. If you don't do anything, we'll look out. Bishop takes g2, king takes g2, and queen e4 check is disastrous. So white doesn't open this diagonal just yet. Instead, chooses the move rook e1 to support the center. f takes e4, bishop takes, bishop takes, rook takes, queen f7 now on the new half-open file, uh, challenging the f2 pawn, queen d2, queen f5, queen d3, rook f8, hits, uh, hits f2, so f4, and now the winning move by black here is, of course, the move g5, just blasting open the king's side, and with these strong pawns in the center, white finds half of his army sort of stranded on the queen's side. Uh, queen f3 was met with g takes f4, and now after h4, this is sort of just desperation for white, and it's completely winning for black, kind of out of nowhere. Uh, knight f1, rook f8, rook e1, queen f6, rook a4, knight c7, and I'm switching the arrow keys now, rook a5, queen d6, and after f3, this is just hopeless, just hopeless with this pawn on f2, and these two pawns marching their way down the board, a very nice win by Etienne Picro. So. With that, I think I'm putting to rest these lines. Uh, after b6, hopefully you have a good idea of what you're doing in all of these variations now. Uh, it is just a nice, fun way of getting a game against the Catalan that I'm recommending. Now, with the remainder of the lecture, I wanted to focus on the next two most popular moves, which, rather than queen c2, are going to be the move knight e5 in this position, as well as the move queen a4 in this position. So let's take a look at those, starting off with the more testing move, knight e5, in my opinion. So switching over to a game now between uh, Ringar and Brandon Jacobson. Brandon Jacobson is actually uh, a player who's been to St. Louis before, played in numerous tournaments here, and is still moving on up in the chess world. But let's see what happened here. In the game, d4, we of course arrive at the Catalan, uh, castles, castles, black captures on c4, and now rather than queen c2, we do see the move knight e5. Uh, and the point of this move is pretty direct. You immediately open up the light squared bishop, challenging this diagonal. You also threaten to, ta to take this pawn with the knight rather than the queen, and uh, you sort of force black's hand to go into one of two or three variations here. Uh, I'm gonna recommend the main move, which is to play knight c6. Uh, black players have also been trying to move c5 here, but I do think that white does end up with sort of a slight edge uh, in these c5 variations. So let's focus on knight c6. Uh, now against knight c6, there's sort of two options for white. I am only gonna really focus on the move knight takes c6, because I do think this is the most testing line. Bishop takes c6, uh, once again, hasn't really been the the most testing, in my opinion. Uh, let's briefly look at it. Bishop takes c6, b takes, knight takes is a fork. So queen e8, knight takes e7, queen takes e7. And now the game can progress a, in a variety of ways. Um, most often the move queen a4 is chosen. And the reason it's chosen is to try and combat the idea of c5, 
by offering white the option of playing queen to a3 with the pin. But against queen a4, uh, black can sort of just break with e5. And now life is, is pretty comfortable, I think, for, for black here. Uh, the only reason uh, white can try to claim an advantage is one, uh, obviously white has an extra pawn, although we'll see it may not stay that way. And two, uh, these pawns may look a little bit less comfortable than these pawns. So let's just follow the variation a little bit. Queen d3, rook a d8, queen e3, queen h5, f3 now, bishop c4. Uh, and now after knight c3, rook f e8, queen f2, knight into d5. You kind of see that black has activated all of the pieces, a ton of pressure on e2. And I think almost every game that has reached this position has actually ended in a draw. Just for example, rook e1, knight takes c3, b takes c3, and now a move like queen a5. And every one of white's pawns is weak. White does have an extra pawn, though, so he shouldn't really be worse. Just for example, uh, e4, rook d3 is simply regaining this pawn without too much controversy here. White doesn't even attempt to defend it in most cases. So that's a quick overview of bishop takes c6. Uh, white sort of liquidates a ton of pieces, black breaks in the center, and then life uh, kind of goes on. Uh, rather though, knight takes c6, I do think, is the move that could potentially cause black some problems. So let's see what happened in this game. We have knight takes c6, b takes c6, and now knight a3 is the main idea. Once again, if bishop takes c6, this one isn't really too threatening. Black simply moves the rook out of the way. If knight c3, bishop b7, and black is doing quite all right here. So uh, knight a3 is the most testing going for this pawn. And now black captures on a3. And after b takes a3, we get a very, very strange pawn structure where everybody's pawns are doubled or tripled and isolated. And it is definitely a, a pretty forcing game. Uh, here there are two main branches for black. Knight d5 and bishop a6 are both playable. I like the move bishop a6, so it's what I'm going to recommend. Queen d2 here. Rook over to b8 is natural, getting the rook on the open file, also getting it off of this long diagonal. Now after queen a5, there are two moves in this position. One move is rook b6, and one move is queen c8. Uh, and now I actually spent quite a lot of time looking at the move rook b6, and uh, I did not like the, the positions and the variations that, that uh, I was coming up with looking at previous games, looking at what the computer recommended. And so I, I very much am going to recommend the move queen c8 rather than rook b6. Because I do think black might actually be ending up in a little bit of trouble here if you play the move uh, rook b6. So queen c8 is my recommendation. And now anybody who's anybody is playing the move a4 here with white with the idea of activating this bishop along this diagonal. Also, taking away the b5 square from any of the black pieces. And now rook d8 is very, very sensible. Just getting on the half-open file, challenging this pawn. Bishop a3 now by white is by far the most common. And now rook takes d4 is very, very natural. Uh, gaining another pawn for the troubles. Now rook f to b1 is most often played. And now the move rook takes b1 is potentially playable for black, but I do prefer this line with rook b6, which is a bit more common. Uh, of course, the obvious downside to rook b6 is bishop c5. And now after rook d7, we have actually so far followed uh, quite a number of games. Notably, we're following a game between Wesley So and Hikaru Nakamura from the 2016 Sinkfield Cup. We're also following a game between David Howe and Mickey Adams. Uh, there's also a, a couple other games, but those are the two big names that we have so far following. Of course, we're also following our main game so far. And then this is where it starts to branch out. In all of the games, white in this position played the move uh, rook to d1. The idea being we're just challenging this file before capturing this rook. And here, a move like rook b8 isn't really going to be super comfortable for black. You do save the exchange, but you face the move uh, rook takes d7, knight takes d7, and bishop takes a7. And now after rook a8, bishop d4, white has the two bishops. Uh, the material count is black is technically up a pawn, but it's a tripled pawn and against doubled pawns, so it's a little bit unclear if the material matters. And actually, uh, white is immediately regaining this pawn here. So I don't really like this way of playing. This is actually how Mickey Adams chose to play against Daniel, uh, David Howell. I thought his name was Daniel for a second, losing my mind over here. But uh, Mickey Adams did end up drawing that game, but I, I'm still not a huge fan of that line. 
Uh, there's also the move rook takes d1, and that is playable here. This has actually been played the most often. But after rook takes d1, white does have the open file. And we sort of transpose to a lot of lines after rook b8. There's also the move h6, which was actually uh, Hikaru Nakamura's choice against Wesley So. But unfortunately for Hikaru Nakamura, he ended up losing that game. So I was not a huge fan of this line either with h6, sort of just making a waiting move. And so that's how I ended up finding this game uh, between Brandon Jacobson and Tengue Ringuar. I, I have no idea how to pronounce his name. I apologize again. But he came up with this move, knight d5. And I quite like this move because it allows uh, white an opportunity to kind of go wrong here. White will never capture c6? Well, sometimes white, white captures c6. The kind of the point is that so far it hasn't been worth the tempo to take on c6. Uh, after knight d5, there are, of course, various options for white that are all you know, totally, totally reasonable. Uh, so this is kind of where the opening theory, I think, uh, can, can kind of end. Uh, we are following multiple games until this point where knight d5 makes this game unique. Now, uh, many of you are probably wondering, why not capture this rook? And taking this rook is totally fine for white. But after c takes b6, you sort of solve uh, black's issue of having these triple pawns. And it's just another comfortable exchange sacrifice. This queen can come on back to a square like d2 or even uh, e1, if you prefer. And then a move like c5 could be coming, uh, controlling a ton of squares. A simple move like h6 could happen as well. And it's just going to be a, a game from this position. You know, just for example, moves can be played. Just more chess moves to, uh, to happen here. Uh, so that's bishop takes b6. I don't want to talk too much about it uh, because, you know, while this might be seen as, as sort of the main variation, those positions really are going to be comfortable for black. You just sort of eventually uh, get your pawns rolling on the queen side. Just try to activate your pieces, get your queen out, get the rook uh, onto a reasonable square. And from there, uh, play is just going to follow pretty naturally. You know, it's, it's not uh, a terribly difficult position for black, black to play. You know, you sort of have this one huge uh, edge in exchange for the exchange, and you just sort of play around it. Uh, in the game, though, Brandon Jacobson chose the move e4, which is a perfectly fine move. It forces this knight off of the nice d5 square, and so now the knight comes back to f6. But unfortunately now for white, now really is the time to go in for these variations. Uh, you can bring this queen over to e5, and then black is going to bring this rook in to d3. But the upside now is that uh, black is at least uh, sacrificing exchange to get to this position. Whereas with the move played in the game, which is queen c3, this was perhaps just a little bit too nonchalant. Because now black has a very, very strong move here. Uh, so black to move and sees an advantage from this position. See if you guys can, uh, can find it here. Black to move and sees the advantage. What do you guys have for me? Why is this opening not popular? It is very popular, in my opinion. Never see it in games. Uh, well. One of the main proponents of the Catalan was uh, Vladimir Kramnik, who of course has now retired, and with it brought away a lot of the Catalan with him. Uh, you don't see it at the top level too often, because uh, really black is, is supposed to be fine in the main variations. And, you know, uh, at the top level these days, they do try and still prove some kind of advantage in most of their games. So the move is, in fact, as the chat is suggesting, the move rook d3. Uh, and the point now is that you are facing, uh, you are giving white a difficult decision that he has to face. Uh, option number one is to just move the queen and allow black to save the exchange. Uh, but then, of course, you've allowed black to save the exchange. <laughs> and uh, if he can save the exchange, black probably should save the exchange here. Option number two is to capture on d3 and then capture on b6. But now, of course, we have even further fixed black's pawn structure. And this pawn on d3 is going to be massively, massively powerful. Uh, and when faced with this decision, Brandon Jacobson actually said, no way am I playing this position. This is way too good for black with this pawn on d3. And so he chose to play queen c2 instead. But now after rook b7, it is just going to be a comfortable advantage for black. So 
this was really the moment where white went wrong with the move queen c3. Uh, much better is to capture the exchange first and then play similar positions with an active queen on e5 and this pawn not yet on d3. After rook d3, you do end up in some similar stuff. Also notably, after a move like bishop f1, uh, sometimes uh, black doesn't even save this rook, although probably it, he should here and go for a uh, go for the similar type of positions that were offered uh, with rook d3, except down two exchanges rather than, than one. For example, c5 is a playable move, bishop takes d3, c takes d3, and you get a crazy, crazy position where black has rolling past pawns, but has actually offered up two exchanges to, uh, to get here. Uh, this could be a lot of fun. Uh, notably, though, you know there, this is not forced by, uh, by black. And things like this are potentially playable as well, with a move like uh, rook takes d1 being okay, but this is still also definitely on the cards for black. But let's see how the game finished. Queen c2, and now knight takes e4. We do end up sacrificing the ex exchange anyways, but now with this pawn on d3, uh, Brandon unfortunately just gets overrun. f3 falls, the queen comes back, and it's just way too many pawns now in the center, and Brandon resigned in this exact position now. Uh, so a great game by a R Ringer? Ringer? R I can't pronounce his name. But great game by him anyways. Knight d5 is uh, a really interesting move, and I think it offers black quite uh, a lot of opportunity for white to go slightly awry, as he did in this game. All right, moving along, I did want to take a look at a game in the third most popular variation for white, which is this variation with queen to a4. So let's jump into it here. We have a game between Fabiano Caruana and Viswanathan Anand. So of course, they played the Catalan. Otherwise, I would not be talking about it. We have d takes c4, and now we've looked at queen c2 in this line with b6. We've looked at knight e5 and knight c6. But queen a4 is very much still uh, a move that, that gets played quite often here. And so with queen a4, white is kind of just allowing black the best version possible of queen c2, right? Queen c2 is more popular because after a6, the move a4 is legal, and you don't get to play this move b5. Now with queen a4, no such luck. And I do think the most popular move in this case is the best with a6. And after a6, black really doesn't have uh, any problems in this variation. If you are a diehard b6 player, I do think it is potentially playable in this position as well. After queen takes c4, you would just transpose to the stuff we already know. And against knight e5, uh, still queen takes d4, bishop takes a8, queen takes e5, bishop back to f3, and knight d5. Uh, we would transpose again with queen takes c4. There is potentially like a queen takes a7 option to look out for, but after knight c6, life should be pretty comfortable for black here as well. Uh, just a pretty interesting uh, way to go about it. So if you really do like these b6 lines, I do think it is playable here. I have not found a refutation with this queen on a4 rather than c2, but it's sort of a case of, you know, you don't need to do this because a6 is just so comfortable for black. So a6, queen takes c4 is really the only idea. And now just b5 by black is, is very nice. The queen comes back to c2, and we develop with bishop b7. We sort of get everything that we want. We expand on the queen side a little bit. We get our bishop on this long diagonal to contest white's bishop. And we're going to continue now with stuff like an eventual c5 uh, quite often. The move bishop d2 was chosen in this game. And now if neither player is feeling very ambitious, there is a line with bishop e4, queen c1, bishop b7, queen c2, bishop b4, queen c1. <laughs> or uh, after this move, you, black can deviate with a move like knight bd7, or white can deviate with a move like bishop f4. And this is just totally fine. Uh, I'm going to recommend instead the move that Vichy Anand played here, which is just bishop d6. You sort of just take control of this uh, f4 to b8 diagonal before white has a chance to put his own bishop there. Notably, if bishop f4 happens in this position, you're sort of running into bishop d6 anyways when you are challenging this bishop directly. Uh, there are other options here. Knight d5 isn't bad. Knight c6 isn't bad either. Going for stuff like knight b4 to b5, which is why this bishop was placed on d2. But OK, bishop d2, bishop d6. Uh, knight h4 played in this game, offering up this trade of bishops, which Vichy accepts. 
Now knight b to d7. And after e4, there is the threat of e5, so black moves the bishop back. And it does seem like black kind of lost some tempi by playing bishop d6 and bishop b7, but it's sort of a case of it, it doesn't really matter uh, because black's position is just so comfortable. The light squared bishops are off the board, c5 is coming uh, very, very quickly, and there's no reason to really be afraid at all for black. Now the move, knight c3, was played in the game, and now black does expand with the move c5. Uh, dc5 was played in the game, knight c5, and now it, it really is clear to see there's not really any imbalances left. Uh, white has actually, by taking this extra space with this e4 pawn, given himself more of a weakness than an advantage with e4 being something that now has to be defended. And I, I think black is simply better in this position. Bishop e3 was played in the game. Queen d3 offers up a queen trade. Uh, rook ac1, Bishy takes the queens off the board and takes off the e4 pawn as well. And now, just up a pawn, Vichy does end up uh, going on to just win this game. Uh, brings the king around, brings the rook in, and f5 check. And now this is some very clever endgame business. Uh, if you want to talk about endgames, though, attend the endgame class on Wednesday. This is an openings class, so we don't care about Vichy's beautiful technique. Takes the knights off the board as well. And now, here we go. And Vichy wins the king and pawn endgame by pushing these two pawns together in tandem. This king not able to stop both of these pawns simultaneously. Of course, these pawns defend each other by the rule of some kind of rectangle. Don't ask me about it. Uh, that's a question for the endgame class. So, Fabi simply resigns in this position. Uh, so that was a very, very brief overview of the queen a4 line, but I really don't think it's very testing at all. Just a6 and b5, and then, then bishop b7. Uh, we do have some extra time left, and in order to fill this time, I'm going to look at another game in the b6 variation, because this is what you're going to be facing most often if you play this way with the black pieces. This queen c2 move is quite common. So I wanted to take a look at another very famous game that essayed this variation, and that is a game between Ding Liren and Fabiano Caruana. So if Ho Yifan was kind of, or Hu Yifan was the uh, introducer of this idea, then this is the game that sort of really brought it into the top 10. Uh, and uh, ever since these two games, this idea has been played a little bit more often. So let's look at this game. We have d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight f3, d5, g3, bishop e7, bishop g2, castles, castles, d takes c4, queen c2, b6 by Fabi. And now the move knight e5 was once again played by Ding Liren. Queen takes d4, bishop takes a8, uh, queen takes e5. Bishop f3, uh, as I've said, is the best square for this bishop, guarding uh, some squares on the king side, also guarding the e2 pawn. Knight d5 is natural to stop bishop f4, as we talked about. Queen takes c4, bishop a6, gaining a tempo. Now rather than go to a4, Ding Liren actually plays the move queen b3. And I do think queen b3 is sort of just objectively a, a worse square than a4. So in light of the first couple games that we looked at, uh, some of the ideas that black has, I'd like you guys at home to go ahead and try to find Fabi's next move in this position here. Uh, Fabi's next move, keeping in mind some of these ideas we've looked at in previous games. What do you guys got? What you got for me? Find the idea for Fabi. Mm. Bishop takes e2 is not going to quite do it for us here. Rook e1 is an unfortunate pin. This was White's idea. So not taking on e2 in this case. All right, nobody has the idea. All right, I'm giving up on you guys. The idea, of course, is not to continue, as we saw in the game between Aronian and Hu Yifan with c5, but rather to play the move uh, knight c6 immediately, as you guys are, are getting it now, uh, Akash and player both, with the idea. 
uh, you want to bring this knight to d4. And this is sort of why queen b3 is a worse move than queen a4, in my opinion. Queen a4 did a nice job of preventing this idea by challenging both of these squares. But now knight c6, and we're getting this d d4 square all the faster. And only after this knight comes here, uh, then we do have the option of backing it up sort of with the move c5. Uh, Ding Loren made a quick adjustment of his queen now, uh, only now challenging both of these squares. But after bishop b7, uh, black is comfortable in defending these pieces. Knight c3 was Ding Loren's choice to develop. And now Fabi does bring this knight into, uh, into d4. And we have quite an interesting position on our hands once again. So this bishop is being challenged, as is the e2 pawn. And Ding decided that this was cause enough to actually exchange it for this knight on d5. And this is often what we see in games uh, in this line. Uh, the pressure is enough that white does end up giving black some sort of other advantage, quite often the bishop pair, to go along with his one pawn that he has for the exchange. And so bishop takes d5. Now black has one pawn for the exchange, as well as the bishop pair, and centralized active pieces like this knight on d4. It should be enough for uh, total compensation. e takes d5, played in the game. Now after bishop f4, the move knight takes e2 check would once again be a bit of a mistake because rook e1 is still a devastating threat. So queen f6 instead just removes the queen from the threat of capture. Now bishop takes c7 was actually potentially uh, playable here, but black is going to use this open file. White has to come on back and this is still going to be okay for, uh, for black here. Actually, bishop c5 immediately might be quite strong, just going for threats on f2. For example, bishop back to f4, knight back to e6, and all the pieces are just coordinating beautifully for black. So not bishop takes c7 in this case, but rather rook a to d1, and now the move c5 is quite natural. As I said, Black looking to expand with this uh, extra pawn, and he does so uh, He does so here as well, with c5 supporting the knight in the center, and it is, once again, a comfortable position for Fabi. Uh, now, queen takes a7 is potentially playable here, but the move queen c6 is actually going to be quite strong. And it's kind of a case of where there's just a, a lot of mines uh, for, for white to dodge. Like, like he's in a minefield, right? You know, to continue the analogy, uh, where else do you find mines? I'm not sure. Uh, there's all these tempting options like taking on c7 and taking on a7, but quite often they just turn out to not be good for white, as is the case here. Queen c6, and black is actually, you know, I, I, I would go ahead and say winning in this position after queen c6, uh, because the, the white queen is going to find itself just sort of getting trapped on a7. Uh, and that's why I, I do like this variation, because, you know, with accurate play, both sides are fine, but if there's just one kind of misstep by white, then black could very easily be, be winning this game. Uh, for example, if queen a4, move b5, all these squares are covered, queen a5, rook a8, and this guy is, is dead. Well, actually, queen c7 is a threat, so bishop d8 instead, queen a3, b4, queen a4. Knight takes e2 check. And this is slightly more complex than just winning a free queen, but it is still just going to be winning. Uh, taking here, for example, is good enough. So not queen takes a7, rather, but bishop e3. Now knight f3 check is an interesting sa sacrifice by Fabi. Uh, e takes f3, and now d4 regains the piece. f4, d takes c3, b takes c3, bishop into f3. And once again, Fabi is on the offensive. Uh, threatening all kinds of dangerous checkmates. So rook d3 gets played. Now it might be a bit of a mistake for black to go all in here, trying to give checkmate. There is just one variation that keeps the advantage for white and doesn't lose the game immediately, but it is good enough. Queen d7 stops queen h3, offers a queen trait, and will be saving the game for white. So instead, Fabi calmly plays the move bishop c6, retreating this bishop from any tactics. Also daring white once again to capture on this square, in which case the move queen f5 is actually going to be winning uh, with threats on the king side. For example, uh, rook fd1, queen e4, and this is just, just over. If you bring this rook to d1, still queen e4, and you can't play f3 because of this bishop. 
So queen back to b3 instead. Now once again, if we try the move, uh, sorry, queen f5, now the idea is c4 for white if queen to h3. f3 is good enough if queen here. f3 is good enough once again, now that this bishop stays defended. So instead, we saw the move queen f5, c4, bishop e4 by Fabi, rook d2, queen h5, f3, and after bishop f3, f5. And Ding Loren has sort of def has sort of defended well enough in order to uh, escape with a draw, we'll say. Uh, more maneuvering, the queen comes out to c6, bishop d6, and Fabi is doing just fine in this endgame. Because despite only having one pawn for the exchange, uh, White's king is far too weak in order to play for an advantage here. As soon as these major pieces sort of leave the king to try and, you know, win somehow, uh, threats of checkmate come very, very quickly on the second rank, on h3, all sorts of nasty business. So after a3, the players agreed to a draw here. Uh, so hopefully you guys now have a pretty good idea of how to play against the Catalan. Went through five games pretty quickly here. So against the main line, we're uh, suggesting the move b6 against the other lines. Well, I'm just kind of suggesting the main lines because they are, in fact, good enough. Uh, the Catalan, surprisingly, is one of the more theory-heavy openings uh, out of the, the move 1d4 uh, as far as options for white. But hopefully, after this lecture, you guys are now well-equipped to handle it. Uh, that's going to be it from me here on YouTube tonight. If you're watching live, be sure to head over to the Twitch channel for uh, the next edition of Tactics Time. Uh, if you're watching the video, this has been all for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.